So welcome everyone. Um, we are a lot. It would be very nice to, to learn more about who you are, where you're based, what's your research or work about. But because we are so many, we are not going to do uh, introductions, but you can use the chat to say hi. And welcome. This is an early career network webinar. And I will I will share a little about our plan for today and also about the early career network for those of you who don't know it. And of course, you, you are welcome to join. We have the Slack channel. Um, and before I, I share our agenda for today, I will introduce myself. I am Sofia Nani. I'm a researcher from Argentina. My research is mostly about um, biodiversity conservation in, in the Gran Chaco Americano uh, land systems of Argentina, Bolivia, and Paraguay. And I am also a member of the Scientific Steering Committee of GLP. Uh, within the SSC, I am one of the coordinators of the Early Career Network Initiative. You will hear more about that in the next slide. So for today, for this webinar, uh, we have a very exciting activity. We will discuss uh, scientific publications and we will learn uh, uh, some insights uh, based on the perspectives of our three panelists who are um, experts in land system science and have a lot of experience in scientific publications. Uh, Maria Piquet Rodriguez, Navin Ramankuti, and Alexander Shepov. And um, so what the plan for today is that after this short introduction, we will start with their presentations. Um, we will have, uh, after each presentation, we will have small time, maybe one or two minutes for specific questions for, for those presenters. And then afterwards, we, we will have some time for questions and answers and sharing and debate before we wrap up. But before I wanted to share more about our Early Career Network Initiative, maybe some of you don't know it, maybe others have already participated and, and are in the Slack and all that. So the Early Career Network is a recent workforce uh, in, in GLP, the Global Land Program is an interdisciplinary community of science and practice about land systems globally. And we are structured in different workforces and activities. Currently, our international program office is based in the University of Maryland. We also have nodal offices, which are more like regional uh, groups. We have working groups, which are more thematically driven. We will have our open science meeting after five years. It will be in Oaxaca, Mexico in November. And in our last scientific steering committee meeting, we thought that this this connection between early careers and, and the GLP was missing. And we thought it was very important to create it because there are a lot of early careers in our community. There are specific challenges of, of this particular stage. And we thought it was a, a good idea to, to generate this space for you know, interactions and exchange both within early careers and also between early careers and more senior researchers sort of in the way we would do today. So, but we we really want this, this network to be run and sort of designed by the early careers themselves. So in the in our open science meeting in, in Oaxaca, we will have a whole day dedicated to the early career network in which we will specifically work in designing the structure of the network and our activities, etc. But of course, not everyone will be present in the open science meeting. So this will be like a permanent, uh, we will have permanent and regular activities like the webinars we've been holding uh, monthly or bi-monthly on our Slack channel. So you are, of course, very welcome to join. Uh, mostly what, what we want to promote is to grow and learn from one another uh, based on our interactions. And, and we wanted to create this particular space for, for you early careers to, to, to do that. Um, and with that, and now moving to our specific topic for today, uh, we thought that in our previous webinars, uh, different things re related to scientific publishing came up, came out, and it makes sense, of course, because we know it's a very challenging uh, activity. It's something at the core of the activities that we do as scientists, and it can have particular uh, challenges for early careers that are sort of expressed in these concepts of publish or perish and a lot of different you know uh, things that we must face when when we need to publish 
But there are also, it can also be a very rewarding experience. It's the way in which our discipline grows. It's how we, we share our questions and answers to, to the academic world and sometimes beyond. So in this webinar, what we wanted to do hopefully is uh, based on the experience and the insights from our panelists to try to share tips and ideas and that can make maybe your own experience less challenging and, and more rewarding. Um, so with that, we can we can move to our first uh, panelist, which uh, who's going to be Alex, uh, and he will share his his insights. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, so I would be very happy to join. Let me see if I can uh, share the screen. So yes, and then a uh, few kind of the notions. And uh, probably it will be not necessarily opening uh, something new, but rather placing in some sort of the order and sharing the experience. And uh, I will primarily talk about, well, how to maintain a good uh, publication habits and make relevant societal impact that we all would like to do. And by looking at the slide, uh, you can notice that the uh, publications are just uh, increasing tremendously, which makes, first of all, excitement about how much research is available uh, for decision making and improving our society. But probably something can be blinking that also the, uh, the tendency of publication per scientist also changed quite a lot. So in this way, we would like probably uh, maintain a good publication habits making, first of all, societal impact and develop uh, also sustainable career for ourselves, not uh, overcommitting ourselves right in the beginning. And so also av avoiding the falling into the traps of publishing sharks <laughs> or crocodiles and bad habits in publishing. That's important to, uh, to figure out with the right from the beginning of our career. And I showed uh, just generated something from ChatGPT what machine learning thinks about paper mills. And uh, there will be not much to talk about, but I identified maybe a five uh, sort of the pillars. And one, uh, once we consider about the publishing and I share based on very good advice for my PhD and my PhD experience is that please consider always about prioritizing impactful research. Uh, that addresses the specific gaps rather than minor increments for so-called short-lived publications. And impactful research, it doesn't necessarily mean you need to go immediately to the nature type of the publications. Uh, this is for you and with your audience to identify where you can make a relevant impact and to work on that. So the second is uh, probably to set the realistic goals um, and avoid of being influenced by other habits uh, or the habits of other people. And there are plenty of the examples of uh, influencers for the Twitter, which tweet almost every day while look guys are published another paper and another paper. Uh, that will, first of all, uh, damage a lot yourself and we all unique, but also it's not necessarily the best habit. But also, um, you should not follow the so-called short-term job market trends. Sometimes there are some sparks where, let's say, there is a ill uh, requirement to present 20, 10 or 20 papers published. This is, doesn't lead to anywhere. In this way, opt for fewer but more significant publications uh, over many very small increments and prioritize your time. And looking back at my career, I had different types of the publications, but the most cited publication in my field appeared in Alantius policy. And that uh, showed that how much I incremented in my own community. And with this, uh, I come to the third pillar is about uh, select the right journals where you feel uh, so-called or the sense of the community and excitement. You belong to Global Land Program, but maybe you belong to other relevant societies. And each community has its own priority with the journals. So while publishing in top tier journals like Nature Science uh, is not expect, expected, of particularly for early career scientists, uh, and this is count also if you go into the market, it's essential to publish in a reputable and field relevant journals indexed in a, in a core uh, web of science collection. And this is what you should prioritize, 
not immediately nature science, but what belong, where you feel yourself you belong to. And also my recommendation, avoid so-called generalist uh, journals that lack distinction. And even uh, among uh, distinguished publishers, you can identify the some journals with other face. That will not necessarily uh, bring uh, understanding of your research to your particular community. The fourth thing uh, to mention is open access on uh, the, the, the days. It's a really welcome strategy of publishing, but it should not be the main motivator. And keeping in mind another headache where to find as a APC over 4,000 euro. I think there are many other ways to publish with the subscription-based journals, but then you can share the preprints. So it should not be your headache at all. And focus for sure on the first offer papers but also try to collaborate. This will, first of all, open your, uh, broaden your perspective and make more impactful research, diversity expertise, and jointly together in collaboration, exactly, you can enrich your field uh, in this type of the ways. So please always consider not just only struggling yourself on your own as a first paper, but maybe you can produce an aside and another call for paper with your wonderful colleagues and contribute to the field. That's pretty much what I can add on my side. And uh, if there would be a later questions, I would be very happy to, to address and communicate. Thank you, Alexander. We, we can have uh, two minutes for specific questions for, for him, if, if someone wants to ask something. No, okay. There's a question in the chat by Nita. Um, she asks, could you please provide an example of how one can share preprints? Uh, it's a good question. So uh, nowadays journals, first of all, they allow to share the preprints. Uh, so something what is not paginated and you can place in a, as in all the different uh, X archive, different repositories, universities they provide. So anywhere you, you feel it will have a long leaf appearance, uh, this is what you can use as a repository. And nowadays, I brought the example Zenodo. That's one of the uh, platform where you can place your, uh, some they use uh, GitHub and uh, other options where you can put your manuscript, maybe even on several platforms. So in the end, it will be a cross-indexed site and checked uh, and accessed through the internet. Thank you. And then Pablo is asking, what is a short-lived publication? It's a good uh, question. And I sometimes ask myself, well, uh, in my opinion, there are sometimes little incremental studies. Uh, it's very worth, of course, of testing the same method in another area. But if you really don't see that, it just some people, they follow the habit uh, publishing just the same type of method to apply to another area. And the, there is no any extra uh, learning from this type of the example. That will be uh, not necessarily picked well uh, through, through citations. Yeah, it may add extra maybe citations, but I see a lot of the sort of the paper mills that the same type of the small studies are replicated in a number of the ways and there is no any other additional research questions uh, addressed, simply replication of existing studies. So that uh, could be, a, uh, it's fine, but if there are too many such studies, then it's not good at all. Thank you, Alex. I think for to, to keep time, we can move with Maria and then we will have more time for questions and answers. Thanks, Sophia. Um, I'll start sharing my publication. My publication, talking about publications, my presentation. <laughs> I hope you can see it now in presentation mode, hopefully. Yeah, we can see it, Maria. Great. Then again, good morning and or good afternoon, depending uh, where you're sitting. Um, I will bring my expertise today um, on a topic uh, in which I've been um, experiencing uh, or experimenting in the last year. And for me, I really like to work with large teams or large groups um, 
And it's not that you plan it from the beginning like that, but at the end, we all end up working in, in large teams sometimes. And so I would like to share some of, of the learnings, but also the challenges uh, one can face. Um, first of all, a very brief content, and it will not take very long. I will tell you a bit about who I am, my experience, and some tricky decisions um, one has to um, take when you're working uh, with big teams and leading these big teams, right? Okay, so I lead a big team, uh, not a big team, a relative, an intermediate small team um, in Berlin at the uh, Free University in Berlin. Uh, the name of the group is Modeling Human Environmental Interactions. But um, on top of that, I am also part of the GLP. I coordinate the Working Group on Social Ecological Land Systems of Latin America. So I will just show you some examples um, of, um, of some work where we've been doing in relatively large teams. In this example, we were about 23 uh, co-authors and I'll be highlighting my position in these examples because I will make um, uh, some comments on uh, where to place or decisions or how and where authors or co-authors could should be placed. This is another example where I was the first uh, co-author um, and we were about 15 um, authors. For this one, uh, we were again around 20. And as you can see, I'm more in the middle. And this one, which is um, under review, um, we are again around 20 authors and a bit, I am a bit more towards the end, okay? So then moving with these tricky decisions that I mentioned before, um, one of them uh, is the order, an R is missing there, and the order of the co-author. So how do you choose uh, who is going in which position, right? So most of you um, may be aware how this is um, organized, but the first author is the one uh, with the biggest contribution to the paper, and the second one in the second position is usually has the second uh, biggest contribution in a paper. And then you can choose whether after the second one, you follow an alphabetical order, or if there were more than two co-authors um, having an important contribution in the work. And this is the case when you work in big teams, you can use up to the fourth, the fifth, or the sixth co-author in, in the order um, to have them order in, in order of contribution. And from there, where the yellow vertical line is, you can then use the um, alphabetical order. And then the final one, the final author has often um, had a leading role or financing role, is often your advisor, um, the PI of the, of the project as well. So as you can see here, um, I was a postdoc during this work and I worked very closely with the first author and therefore my second position there. But then another decision can be, um, as, I, as I mentioned before, sorry, this, alpha, this alphabetic order can start from the sixth author. You can see here we are six, uh, we were six um, co-authors that contributed largely to this work. Um, and after the sixth one, then we have structured it exclusively alphabetically until the end. So in this case, the last author uh, did not have a um, an advisory role or a financial role. Um, we worked in this case uh, in very horizontal and horizontally and not very hierarchically, and that was also a decision um, we took. Uh, and the paper, of course, the journal um, agreed with that. Uh, but often you can even have now more and more often uh, some journals allowed for two first authors. Uh, so. In this case, this two, I hope you can see it in the upper right, um, uh, this Fontana Rosa and Sarva, both uh, uh, first, uh, you can see first and second uh, co-authors are accounted as a first author. So they are sharing the first authorship. Um, and then we also have another um, organization for authorships, but I think this is quite interesting because it was not possible before. When I was doing my PhD, no one was doing this. And now we start to see this more and more often. Oops. Um, 
So when you also are the first author of, um, of a large team, um, it's important on how to take care of correspondences. How, how many emails do you write? How much do you bother people? Um, so I would say um, not too much, but not too little. It's important to find the, find the balance. It, it, and it's there, it's very important to culturally know uh, the team you're working, you're working with, right? Um, but in this case, it's important to follow, uh, uh, to, to be aware that you are the leader. So, and I have another slide on, on this leadership afterwards. But also uh, don't think that you have to do the entire work alone because you are the first author. So uh, in this case, when you work in big teams, it's often the case that you can group people and then have um, or appoint um, speakers for each group that would be the main coordinators of subgroups and would um, co-lead with you the work. In this case, uh, we worked in six regions of the world, for example, and we were two to three people working in each of the regions. Um, and, and we had um, speakers for each region coordinating with the main authors of, of this work, for example. Um, and a bit on leadership, um, you have to, of course, own it. You are the leader uh, when you are uh, the first author um, of a publication. So it's important to own it and, and believe it. But it's also important to follow the leadership style that is that really goes with you without forgetting that it's ethical and fair to others. And very briefly, I wanted to point at this paper, which I think is very interesting um, and criticizes and revises ways in which um, early career researchers um, can slash should uh, work uh, published ethically um, in its for me, my, my paper recommendation, in case you don't know it, um, you should also, what I highlight here, um, that I think it's important to believe in yourself, of, of course, but don't forget to ask for help when you think things are too much. Uh, and this can it can get quite daunting when you're working with big groups. And remember that you're not alone. Uh, for me, it has been always very useful to, to have an anchor colleague that I could trust and uh, often was my second co-author, right? Um, and we could share many of, of the concerns and the work there. Another tricky decision when you work in big groups and in diverse groups um, is the question of, okay, who's, who's uh, paying this publishing fees that uh, Alexander was mentioning also before, right? So depending the composition of your team, um, often, if the majority of the team comes from the global south, uh, you can ask for a waiver of the fees or the publication fees. But it's also good to know, in case you don't know, that some of the northern countries, um, especially in Europe, have collaboration agreements with, um, with publishing uh, journals, um, such as the deal agreement in Germany, where um, we have a broad range of um, journals belonging to Wiley, Springer, Nature, and Elsevier, for which if you open, if you publish um, open science, you don't have to uh, pay the fees privately. Um, the universities are covering these fees. So as long as you can have a German partner, for example, in this case, within your co-authors and as a um, correspondent um, author, um, this would be possible. As I said before, um, this is my paper recommendation to close my uh, talk of today. So with this, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Maria. Um, you can go ahead and ask Maria any questions if you have uh, one or write them in the chat. There was a, a nice question uh, that uh, in the chat about uh, how can we define good, jour good journals? Uh, what is a good journal and how to, to identify them? I don't know, Maria, if you have any comments about that. For me, yes, well, um, first of all, a good journal should cover appropriately the topic um, uh, you're working on. This is uh, first of all. But for me, it's very important to try to avoid these predatory journals. Um, so journals that have a million open uh, special issues um, 
and where uh, revisions are done very thinly, very fast. And if you write, read a paper, and by reading a published paper, you think like mm, there are some flaws or I, I'm not convinced about uh, the work they're doing. Yeah, this would call my uh, red light for, for this kind of, of journal. So being critic with what you're reading, I think, try to avoid predatory journals. But I think this is also a question we can open to the other speakers of today, I think. Uh, maybe for later also, right? Thank you, Maria. Yeah, Alexander and, and Navin also shared uh, in the chat their opinion about that. And then Nita is asking if, if you could please uh, talk a little about the case of equal contributions to a paper. Does that mean those people are kind of like the first author irrespective of the order? Yes, that's right. So the, the journals are considering that way. And this is pretty new. I've started seeing it only from last year, I have to say. And I've seen it shared even by three people. The example mm -hmm. I gave you was were only two, but I've seen only by, by three people. Um, yeah. Just to add there that an, an issue I identified with that is that I see that uh, some journals are incorporating that. But in the evaluation systems, for example, in our evaluation system in Argentina, they are not considering that yet. They don't look. So they oh. just consider the first author and don't look. So that, that can be an issue like to navigate with. Uh, Naveen, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I did. Uh, I accidentally put up my thumbs up sign. <laughs> um, uh, I've seen cases where people, when they have, when two people, let's say they, uh, share the first authorship when they present their cvs they switch the order so person a puts their name first in their cv and person b puts their name first in the cv so i think that might be a practice where you can get uh, you know contributions for your co-first authorship mm -hmm. totally um okay Naveen, we can move with you and of course you can keep asking questions uh, in the chat Okay. I am trying to find my, yeah. Okay, so uh, um, both uh, Alex and uh, Alex or Sasha, as we call them, uh, Sasha and Maria had uh, really good presentations in, and which cover in fact a lot of things that are in my mind these days. Uh, the publication system from when I was a graduate student uh, was, it was quite simple when I was a graduate student and it's become a lot more complex these days. Um, and a, a short presentation would have not done justice to the complexity of the problem, but I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that the two previous speakers covered some of those issues. Um, and happy to come back to the Q&A. Uh, for my presentation, I, I'm going to keep it quite simple and go back to, uh, you know, the core of what it means to publish something uh, and go back to some kind of maybe some simple messages. Um, so stick, uh, a long time ago, I read a blog post by someone um, where somebody had analyzed uh, for not good reasons, I, I must add, analyzed what makes somebody successful at public publishing papers. Why do some people publish, you know, uh, 100 papers a year? And why do some others publish only one paper a year? So this person did the analysis in order to kind of understand why people are productive. Uh, but in doing the analysis, I think there are some uh, key messages that might be helpful in thinking about what does it take to get a paper out? Um, so eight steps to publishing. Um, and the key message here is that uh, when we think about publishing a paper, we think about it as one thing. We think about, oh, I need to get a paper out. Uh, but the process to from uh, to getting a paper out is, is quite complex and there are multiple steps to it. This is an adaptation of into eight steps. There may be more steps to think about. Um, and the key message is that each of these steps is actually important and people can get stuck along the way uh, of any of these steps. Um, and I see that uh, in my own experience as well. So the first step to a publication, and in some ways the most important step is just the ability to think of a good problem. 
where does the publication start? Uh, it starts from an idea. And where do these ideas come from? Uh, that is a million dollar question, right? Uh, we, we have really no idea. There is no uh, you know, structured way to do this. Uh, in research programs, in uh, graduate school, we have mentors who lead us to good problems. Uh, but we, we really don't have a structured way to get to a good idea. Uh, they come, they emerge from, I don't know, it's an emergent property in some ways. You read papers, suddenly you have this aha moment, ah, I can work on this problem, or here's a research gap. Uh, so I would say wide amount of reading, going to conferences, talking to colleagues, a uh, whole bunch of these things uh, result in this uh, I, a good idea. Once you have a good idea, that's not enough. A lot of times you can stop at having a good idea and not doing anything about it. Um, this happens to a lot of people. A lot of times there are, you know, we say there are many more good ideas than time to work on it, right? So sometimes you have a good idea, you tell a colleague, oh, we should work on it, and then nothing happens. It, it sits in a, you know, a pile of good ideas. Uh, so the next step is kind of the determination to go ahead and do something with that idea to think about, okay, I have a good idea. How can I collect data uh, to to work on it? Uh, maybe I can write a conceptual paper. Uh, maybe I have a good idea, but I don't actually have the skills to work on it. So who do I need to collaborate with to uh, to put this idea into action? Um Okay, now let's say you've gotten through those first two steps, then you have to um, have the ability to recognize a worthwhile result. Um, so you, you, do, you do a lot of work, uh, but you need to say, oh, now I have the results and this is worthwhile and this is worth publishing. The fourth step is really, really complicated is the ability to make a decision as to when to stop. Um, again, this is uh, not easy. Um, I sometimes tell my students, and this is a nice quote that I heard from someone else, is that a paper is never finished, it is only abandoned. Um, so the stopping point, uh, you, you could continue working on a project forever and never publishing, and it's sort of an art to know when to stop. Um, sometimes some people stop too early, uh, some people stop too late, and you have to find your own comfort zone on when you think a paper is done. Uh, your mentors can help with this. Your co-authors can help. Uh, sometimes you send it out for review and you found that you stopped too early because the reviewers come back and tell you to you know, make suggestions for more revisions. Um, the next step is to actually the ability to write. Right? Uh, sometimes you can have a lot of work, uh, but uh, you, are, you struggle with writing. Um, I find that a lot of, with a lot of my students, this is something I can't emphasize enough. Uh, uh, people don't take the writing process very seriously. The ability to write clearly, uh, to have your thought process clear and to be able to communicate that thought process very clearly is, uh, is quite challenging. Uh, so, and this takes work. It's not that uh, people are born to be good writers. Uh, it takes work to write, to learn to write. And it, that also means uh, putting a lot of time into it. There are lots of really good books on writing. Uh, and technical writing, and a lot of practice, I would say. Um, then comes the step of, uh, this is a very simple step, but it's a hard step for a lot of people, the determination to submit the paper to a journal. Uh, so one simple way to think about that is uh, a lot of PhD students publish their thesis, and then when they're done with their thesis, uh, there are these chapters that need to go into journals, a lot of people get stuck just in that submission process. They just don't have the energy to, um, either they've gone on to a job and they don't want to think about papers anymore, that's fine. Uh, but if you really want to get your papers out, uh, you need to get to that step of actually submitting to a journal. That The process, the, the reason why you might be stuck may be because you don't want to get, go through the process of getting peer reviewed and responding to revisions and all of that. Uh, you're just tired thinking about that process, but it's very important to do that process of submission to get to the next stage. Uh, the 
seventh step is the ability to what I call constructively respond to reviews. Um, when reviews come back, they can be quite harsh uh, sometimes, uh, but it's very, very important to take those reviews seriously. Um, if you are on Twitter and other social media, there is this uh, meme these days about the you know reviewer number two meme, right? Where the reviewer number two is always a harsh one who trashes your paper. I really hate that meme. Uh, and the reason I hate that meme is uh, reviewers are people who, two or three people who have volunteered their time to read your paper and give you comments. So at a basic level, I think we need to respect that time, right? You didn't pay the person to read your paper. Uh, so at the basic level, even if they were harsh, yes, I've received lots of harsh comments, but you have to respect at the fundamental level that someone took the time to read your paper. Um, so the thing I always tell my students when they either are depressed about the reviews or they are angry about the reviews is respect the reviews and go through the process. Um, I have also say in, on the flip side, have several situations where, you know, you take the reviewers comments seriously and you deal with them. Uh, the reviewers do change their minds. Um, so, Take reviews seriously. Just don't always, don't think about rebuttals. People are always thinking about rebutting the reviews. No, you're responding to the reviews. You address the reviews. Uh, you don't want to push back on every comment that the reviewer says, saying this is out of the scope of your my project or I don't agree with you. You want to take each review, think, read about it, think about it, and take it seriously. If you do that, you can change the mind of reviewers. I had a case, uh, just as an example of a paper where we had five reviewers. Four of them hated the paper. Uh, we managed to, at the after the revisions, which took about six months to a year, uh, all four of them changed their mind, right? So that can happen. Finally, rejection. If you're rejected by a first journal, that's not the end of your paper. Persistence is hugely important in getting to publication, which is submitted again and again and again to other journals. Uh, doesn't mean that you have to keep going down to the worst journal possible, um, but you know some persistence of trying two or three different journals um, is is important. Uh, some of my most cited papers, uh, people may not know. You, you know, when you see a paper out there, you probably think, "Oh, uh, great paper! This has been published." But some of my most cited papers went through three or four different journals before they saw the light of the day. Right. Um, so again, um, uh, the key message here is that each of these steps is important to to get from you know one end to the other. Uh, it's very easy to get stuck in any of these steps along the way, and and so it's actually quite important uh, to keep in mind that uh, in the end there is persistence that's very very important in getting to publication. Um, I'm mostly done with my messages. I thought I'll address some of the questions that you had posted in your shared document. Uh, I just took a few of them. I'm happy to take others in the Q&A. Uh, first one, I think Maria already addressed. It's, is it worth being at the end of an author list? Uh, yes, it is worth being at the end of an author list if you are the person who was a senior author. So probably it's not so relevant to early, early career scholars, but if you're a person who are in, who's in a stage of you know acquiring funding and supervising students, Oftentimes, you do put your name at the end of the author as a senior author. Um, there was a question about how can we gauge how valuable are different efforts to publish, such as peer-reviewed papers, op-eds, reports. Somebody asked about book chapters. Um, it's a harder question. As an early career scholar, I would say you know, a focus on peer-reviewed publications uh, is, is what is mostly valued by other people just because of the um, option of peer review. I personally also focus a lot on peer-reviewed publications. Um, I also think those kinds of publications are more widely read by other people. Uh, book chapters are less widely read. They are less accessible. If they are sometimes in a book, you have to buy the book or take it from the library to get it while a journal PDF can be downloaded. Um, but these other forms of publications can sometimes give you practice in writing. So there, you don't need to be exclusively publishing peer-reviewed papers. It can be fun sometimes to write a blog post. It can be fun to write an op-ed. Uh, uh, they, they can be meaningful in other ways. 
the third question is when is a manuscript ready for submission? It's, it's a great question. And I think I, it was one of the steps I addressed, which is uh, knowing when to stop uh, is an art. Uh, sometimes you develop that with the experience, but uh, you can also rely on your mentors and co-authors to say we are you know, ready for submission. Um, sometimes you can send a paper to a, uh, to a, to a friend and ask them, what do you think of this paper? Do you think I get ready for submission? And they may be willing to help you to read through your paper and uh, let you know. I'll stop there and go to Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Naveen. That was very nice. And I think the three presentations complemented each other very nicely. Um, as you can you can go ahead and, and ask questions, you can go ahead and unmute yourselves and ask or write in the chat, or however you feel more comfortable. I just wanted to add that um, it's it's a very there are a lot of tests like Navin said and also Maria and Alexander said and something that that worked for me, uh, particularly in my PhD, but afterwards was to plan ahead because it can be very overwhelming to think of, the, of all these steps uh, in one time. So planning ahead and just trying to think, for example, this is going to be my first paper, this research question or this PhD chapter. And then as I moved into like later stages of my career, someone once told me that it was, if, if, if one wants to continue in, in academia and research, it was uh, good to, to try to have always something that we are working on, like a paper we are working on, and ideally something also that we have already submitted. So it's like a, an ongoing process and it's not easy, but it's a good practice for me. So if, if I'm not writing something in the moment, I try to think, okay, well, what is the question that I'm going to work with? And, and that was useful for me at least. Um, I don't know if there are many questions, other questions we can also, uh, we are now open, opening the, the time, we have like 10 minutes for questions and answers. And we can also go into the, the document where there are other questions you have asked previously. Maybe in the meantime, if uh, some of you feel comfortable, you can also turn your cameras on. I think it's nice if we can see each other. Yeah, absolutely. So um, something that, that came up in our internal discussions when we were planning this webinar is that uh, for, for those of you who are already in Slack, we have uh, shared this document where you could just leave comments, questions you had about this topic. But uh, Nabil brought up that it would be nice to have like a living document, an active document where we can just leave questions that we have. Maybe you're working on something on, on a paper and, and you have some questions and then other early careers or other senior researchers can address them. And we can also make that document grow. It's not something that we have to decide now. Maybe we can continue this discussion in Slack, but I think it's a very, very nice idea. And regarding the access to Slack, we will share the link. Uh, it's just a link that you have to, to, to go to, to click. Um, but I think, I think it, it could be nice to have this active document. We would have to think the proceeding and logistics, but it could be very useful for, for everyone. Perhaps looking at the first question, um, this is something I remember when I was uh, doing my PhD, for me, it was very difficult to choose which journal um, should I, and I know Alexander talked about this, but uh, which journal to use should be the most with the highest impact factor or the most relevant, what is most relevant. Um, so I guess um, some of you may be having uh, similar issues there. Um, and what Naveen also said that, uh, the first journal where you're sending your paper may not be the journal where it ends up being published. So this is also important to keep in mind that uh, sometimes, of course, choose the, what at the end, I think we, most of us end up doing is you try for a higher ranking journal um, and then you go, you lower the, the impact, impact factor um, of the journals um, as uh, the, the publication or the, your work uh, gets rejected. 
um, and that's also another important point um, to talk about rejections because they happen. We all get our papers rejected and it's fine. Um, and so when you start thinking on which journal to send your work, it's always good to have more than one um, journal. Have two or three at least. Um, read carefully the description. Uh, talk to your peers. Uh, also base your choice on the journals, on the publications you're reading, right? Because most likely you want to be published on the journals uh, you're reading. Um, but having more than more than one uh, journal target is also a good option, I think. In relation to that, Mar Maria, someone in the chat, Audrey, is asking how important is it to have the journal in mind before write writing the paper? So are you writing towards that journal's format guideline or are you like more open and have different journals in mind? Navina, see you unmuted yourself. You can go ahead. <laughs> I was going to, I had unmuted myself to answer something else, but uh, go, go, go ahead with your comment. Uh, okay. I can, otherwise, I'll I can see. maybe comment. Uh, there are already some specific journal with their own format and uh, like a nature science uh, plus one. Uh, they are really designed for some kind of the interdisciplinary, uh, multi-dimensional outlook. And that's uh, definitely what you should think about once you prepare your type of the paper. But more or less, we follow this kind of the classic IMRAT structure. So uh, introduction methods, uh, results, discussion. Sometimes there is a, some requirement about number of the words, and it depends exactly on your field. Uh, in certain field, they like a lot long papers, and others they don't. So something uh, a little bit to keep on that side as well, uh, but more to keep maybe in the beginning and thinking about the classic st structure, and uh, then later on uh, see specific requirements. Because if the paper is becoming a bit too long, you can maybe a little bit readjust, place the material in an appendix or cut a bit on a discussion site to accommodate for the journal. And sometimes actually those journals you submit and still they like your paper to have it. So uh, summary is uh, you should be to a certain degree determined where your article maybe belongs to, but it should not, shouldn't be the, the very first thing coming. Yes, Beatriz. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, Sofia. Thanks for organizing and leading. Uh, just a few words. I'm also an early career representative from the International Association of Landscape Ecology uh, in the European chapter. So it's my pleasure to be here. And I know how effort we make to make that work is, um, um, and connect early career scientists is very, very important. And thank you for in this achievement also for Maria, Navi and Alexander for giving us this talk. Um, my, my question would be if you would have any, any words to help um, PhD students more from the Global South that I, I speak for myself, I'm originally from Brazil and usually we make our PhD thesis or dissertation in a format of a book and with chapters. So somehow, sometimes it's really difficult to to frame it to a paper. And it costs a lot because most of the times we publish in our uh, own language and then translate this to another language and to another format. As Professor Alexander was just saying that at uh, this uh, um, more traditional format of 8,000 words and, and this is structure of an article in a journal, no? Um, in some case, this can be really challenging. And I don't know if you would have any, any um, advice for, for the PhD students that are might face this challenge very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Beatriz. Uh, it would be very nice to maybe later on talk about this these two early career networks and, and connect in that way. Um, regarding that question, there is a similar question in the chat that I will share in a minute, but also it's the same structure here in Argentina. And of course, it's a, it's a big challenge. Um, what what sometimes something that that we find it's useful to do is what I said before of planning ahead and trying to think the, the thesis chapters as papers like trying to make that connection earlier 
So afterwards, it's easier to sort of translate. Of course, language is like a different issue. It's another additional barrier. But uh, when you have, when you think of the chapter as like as a paper with a specific research question, I found it was easier to turn it into an article later on. So I think that that can be a useful practice from my experience. And then with language, it's it's that's very difficult. Uh, if one if 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 a person isn't fluent in English, there are always maybe colleagues that can double check and re review the grammar. But yeah, that's an additional problem, of course. There was a question in, in the chat. Uh, it was directed to me. It, it said that um, it's more broad, I think, but it's about uh, someone doing uh, their PhD and struggling with finding specifically what they want to do, what is uh, what are the research questions they want to focus about. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you have any any advice about that, like how to define the themes for a for for a PhD project. I, I think that was the first step in my eight steps. Yeah. Um, and uh, it is the hardest thing that everyone struggles with, right, as a PhD student. Uh, so a lot of the time when uh, I have PhD students, uh, the very first year, uh, they are spending time trying to figure this out. And uh, it is a struggle, but I think I always tell my students, like, sometimes it feels like you're going in circles. But as long as you're spiraling and not circling, it's okay. Uh, as long as you, you know, you come to a center at the end. Uh, so I would say reading widely is important, uh, not not just within your field, but other fields. Having conversations, going to seminars, the kind of intellectual en engagement uh, is what helps. So don't, don't uh, you know, spend your time at your desk. Go talk to other people. Go listen to other people's talks. Um, that, that kind of engagement at some point will spark an idea. And I can't give you a kind of a structured way to get there. Uh, all I can say as a mentor who supervises students is that everyone gets to those questions at some point. Um, the other thing I do when somebody is really stuck, um, which has also happened, that they have 50 questions and they can't decide which question to focus on, um, is to say, start somewhere, start doing some small project, take some data and start getting your hands dirty. And from there, sometimes something will emerge. Uh, don't sit around trying to find a question, start doing some exercise because some, some people can get stuck in trying to get a question. So those are kind of small little tips. Maybe I can add to that. Uh, I totally agree that getting active uh, moves the machine of the thinking. Uh, but also be uh, gentle with yourself because uh, the questions may change over the life of the PhD and that's okay. Yeah, You may end up new and more exciting uh, topics and your um, final uh, research questions may be different than your original ones and that's totally fine. Yeah. So, to, yes, to, to add exactly, readings is a super uh, important because uh, first of all, you can get excitement about something yeah, that uh, would, uh, will raise your curiosity. But actually being in a science, you need to be critical. Even things are published, you may question 10 times if these studies are to a certain degree convincing or you would like them to clarify and maybe to run experiment and to check whether it holds the truth. And this is basically how many aspects of the research also are driven uh, by our curiosity being critical to what has been done before and pushing the science ahead. Thank you, Sasha. So we're running out of time, but I want to address the two other questions that we have in, in the chat. Pablo is asking if we can talk a little about the importance of impact factors and other metrics, like what is the actual relevance of impact factors? So 
Okay, I can quickly try to take that. I mean, I, I think uh, I impact factors are important, especially for early career scholars uh, to publish in journals with, you know, what you might call good impact factor. But the publishing industry has made that a little bit messier because all of these things are being gamed. Uh, all the journals are trying to have higher impact factors and so on. So my uh, suggestion to people, to my own students is to say, don't, uh, you know, don't focus exclusively on the impact factor, like big journals that are in your field that are known as good journals, uh, journals in which you read papers. Um, and and then take a look at the impact factor and see if it's, if it's reasonable. If it's like, you know, 0 0.3, maybe you don't want to publish there, but if it's two and above, it's fine, right? Like it's, uh, so don't, you don't have to aim always for the highest impact factor but find the balance of a journal that's in your field that you and your colleagues, your colleagues are reading um, and that has a reasonable impact factor. So it's a balance. Thank you, Naveen. And then I think this can be the, the last question for this webinar is, uh, what is your experience with journal editors? Are there best practices for interacting with them? That's a good question I'm interested in also. Maybe I can briefly also take that one. Um, I think the best practices for interacting with them is uh, being polite, like with uh, everybody, but also being informed of who they are. It's important to do a little research to whom you're writing and approach them appropriately. So make sure that if you have a PhD, you approach them as a doctor and um, that you're yeah, out of being polite. Um, what was very useful for me was to have a look at a template letter that my PhD advisor used um, to, um, to approach um, editors uh, when you submit a manuscript. And when you get a peek on that, how one supervisor does it and another supervisor, then you get an understanding also what your letter for the editor uh, should have. Um, and that has been very useful. I, I keep on using them. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time, but I think it, it, it makes a lot of sense to continue thinking about this document. Maybe there are a lot of emerging questions and yeah, I think we, we can spend a lot of time discussing this. So maybe we can continue these discussions on Slack and try to think of a mechanism to make this document grow and make it useful for everyone. And, and before wrapping up, a big thanks for to our panelists and also to everyone joining today. It was very nice to have this exchange with you all. Um, yeah, thank you. We will uh, remember to join us on Slack and also we will, uh, our first Early Career Network newsletter will come, no, web, the website will be active next week and the newsletter will uh, come out in a few weeks. So. You are, of course, very welcome to join and, and engage in these activities. Thanks, everyone. Great questions. Good luck. And hope to see some of you at our OSM in Oaxaca. Yes, indeed. I'm also looking forward to uh, meet some of you there. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, and have a good thank weekend. You. Have a good weekend. Have a good Bye. weekend. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you.